Welcome to part 15 of this series on Moby Dick. In this lecture, we will discuss chapters 102 through 114. In chapter 102, Ishmael describes the skeleton of a sperm whale that is displayed in the forests of an island called Trank. The skeleton is worshipped by the people of Trank, and when Ishmael tries to measure the skeleton, the priests of the local tribe object, stating that it is not Ishmael's right to measure their god, but rather their own. But when Ishmael asks them about the measurements, the priests argue amongst themselves about the correct figures. This anecdote symbolizes the contentions between people about metaphysical questions and the difficulty of reaching a consensus about such questions. In chapter 103, Ishmael reiterates the importance of experience in the pursuit of knowledge and also emphasizes the inherent danger in such a pursuit. How vain and foolish then, thought I, for timid, untraveled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous whale by merely pouring over his dead, attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No, only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound, unbounded sea can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. In chapter 104, Ishmael discusses the ancient fossils of whales and the concept of time. He states that time began when man came into existence, and therefore whales existed before time and will exist after man becomes extinct, in other words, after time ceases. This description of whales is a direct reference to the Judeo-Christian God, whom many believe to exist before and after time. In chapter 105, Ishmael supports his assertion that whales as a species are immortal, despite the hunting of them by men. Unlike the American buffalo, which was hunted to near extinction by European settlers, the whales have an impenetrable fortress in the Arctic seas. We account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water. He once swam over the site of the Tuileries and Windsor Castle and the Kremlin. In Noah's flood, he despised Noah's ark, and if ever the world is to be again flooded, like the Neanderthals, to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his frothed defiance to the skies. In chapter 106, Ahab orders the ship's carpenter to make him a new leg because his current leg splintered when he jumped to his boat from the Samuel Enderby. Ahab is particularly careful about the condition of his leg because of an accident that occurred prior to the Pequod sailing from Nantucket. Ahab's ivory leg had somehow twisted and pierced his groin. This was the cause of Ahab's absence during the preparations for the voyage and during the first few weeks of the voyage. Ahab blames Moby Dick for that accident and concludes that the world and life are mainly sources of suffering. The ancestry and posterity of grief go further than the ancestry and posterity of joy. In chapter 107, Ishmael explains that the carpenter of the ship is a very practical man and considers humans as mere machines. Ishmael notes that such an attitude is often held by people who consider mankind as a species rather than as individuals. Seat thyself sultanically among the moons of Saturn, and take high abstracted man alone, and he seems a wonder, a grandeur, and a woe. But from the same point, take mankind in mass, and for the most part, they seem a mob of unnecessary duplicates, both contemporary and hereditary. In chapter 108, Ahab tells the carpenter that he can feel pain in his lost limb, which is known as phantom limb pain. Ahab notes the terrifying conclusions that one might reach after considering this phenomenon. How dost thou know that some entire living, thinking thing may not be invisibly and uninterpenetratingly standing precisely where thou now standest, I, and standing there in thy spite? In thy most solitary hours, then, dost thou not fear eavesdroppers? Hold, don't speak, and if I still feel the smart of my crushed leg, though it be now so long dissolved, then why mayst not thou, carpenter, feel the fiery pains of hell forever and without a body? In chapter 109, Starbuck informs Ahab that the casks of oil are leaking and that the Pequod needs to stop in order to repair them or they will lose all the oil. Ahab initially refuses to stop the voyage because he is not concerned with oil. He is solely bent on revenge against Moby Dick. Be gone, let it leak. I am all a leak myself. I leaks and leaks, not only full of leaky casks, but those leaky casks are in a leaky ship, and that is a far worse plight than the Pequod's man. 
Yet I don't stop to plug my leak, for who can find it in the deep loaded hole, or how hope to plug it even if found in this life's howling gale. But Ahab eventually agrees to stop the ship to repair the casks in order to avoid angering the crew and thus thwarting his plan to kill Moby Dick. In chapter 110, Queequeg falls ill while repairing the casks in the bottom of the hole. During his illness, he orders the carpenter to make him a coffin. After the carpenter finishes the coffin, Queequeg miraculously becomes well. He ascribes the miracle of his convalescence to his remembrance of some important business left undone. At a critical moment, he had just recalled a little duty ashore, which he was leaving undone, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. He could not die yet, he averred. They asked him, then, whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a whale or a gale or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. In chapter 111, Ishmael discusses the serenity of the Pacific Ocean. To Ishmael, the Pacific Ocean seems like heaven. There is, one knows not what, sweet mystery about this sea, whose gently awful stirring seem to speak of some hidden soul beneath. In chapter 112, Ishmael describes the ship's blacksmith, who is named Perth. Perth is 60 years old and had a loving family on land. But he became an alcoholic, lost his job, and lost his family. Like Ishmael, Perth has some doubts about whether to commit suicide, so he resolves to go to sea, which is a metaphorical suicide. Death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. In chapter 113, Ahab commands the blacksmith to make him a harpoon that he will use to kill Moby Dick. Ahab tempers the iron with the blood of the three harpooners, Queequeg, Dagu, and Tashtigo, and baptizes the iron in the name of the devil, not in the name of God. Ego non baptizo te in nomine patris, said in nomine diaboli, deliriously howled Ahab as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. In chapter 114, Ishmael again describes the serenity of the Pacific Ocean and the similarity between the sea and the afterlife. Throughout the novel, Ishmael continually asserts that the ocean conceals the mystery of death. Our souls are like those orphans whose unwedded mothers die in bearing them. The secret of our paternity lies in their grave, and we must there to learn it. In this quote, Ishmael foreshadows the tragic end of the Pequod and the deaths of the crew members. Don't forget to subscribe and join us for part 16 of this series on Moby Dick.